Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing. Last video of 2019, so I hope you enjoy it and wishing everyone continued investing success in 2020. Today we're going to take a look at RBC. It's one of the big five banks and a well-known stock here in Canada. Currently trading at about $103 a share and a 4% dividend yield. I thought this stock would be interesting to look at, not only because it's a core blue chip holding uh, for many Canadians, but they also just released pretty weak Q4 earnings and the stock has sold off over the last month. This video will look and provide an overview of RBC, key considerations for investors including bull, bear, and base case scenarios. Let's jump into it. So let's start off with a, a quick overview of, of Royal Bank. It's Canada's largest bank by market cap, uh, close to $150 billion. They have some quick stats here. Some of this stuff's going to be small, but they've got 85,000 employees, 17 million clients, and they operate in 36 countries. Although you can see here in this pie chart, Canada in the dark blue, U.S. in the royal blue, uh, I think that's about 85% of their revenue come from Canada and the U.S. So we did a video on Scotiabank uh, in earlier 2019. They've got a much more international presence than RBC. RBC vast majority is in Canada and the US. Uh, they've also got five reporting uh, segments with personal and commercial, wealth management, insurance, investor and treasury services, capital markets, and then they've got a corporate uh, support department. Anything else to say here? You can see the contribution to net income by segment. Personal and commercial is about half of it. Capital markets and wealth management also very meaningful. Uh, the other two, not as much. And lastly, on this slide, just talk about their medium-term performance objectives. So RBC targets uh, EPS growth of 7% a year. They also target a return on equity of 16%. Tier 1 capital, or CET1 of, uh, well, they just call it strong, and then they give you their results here. And a dividend payout of 40 to 50%, and you can see they're right in that range over the three to five year period. So that's a quick overview of RBC. And now let's take a look at the uh, stock chart. So you can see over the last five years, they've traded about as low as $70. And if you remember back in early 2016, there was a lot of concern around the Canadian banks and, and, and they all sold off. So RBC traded down to about as low as $70 in early, early 16 um, to about as high as 110. And that was quite recently. Uh, they hit it or got about that high in early 2018, but it's also quite recently right ahead of Q4 earnings uh, where they were up around the $110 range and they've settled back down into about $103 a share after reporting weak Q4 results. Uh, currently trading at a price to earnings of 12 times and that's based on their, their 2019 fiscal year EPS and about a price to book of two times just to give you some context there. So if we move into the financial overview, there's a great 10-year review way at the back of the annual report on page 212. Uh, to avoid you having to get out your microscope, I've pulled a few of the uh, relevant stats that I wanted to talk about and just brought them out here on the left-hand side. So if you look at asset bases growing nicely, $1.2 to $1.4 trillion, deposit base as well is getting close to $900 billion. If you go down here and look at the revenue, revenues climbed from $40.7 billion up to 46 in 2019. And I thought it was interesting here, the net interest income is 43% of revenue. The net interest income here, 19.7. So remember, that's the spread that they make on lending um, versus the non-interest income being fees and other revenue that they're able to generate. 43% of revenue... And if you remember, we did that video on Scotiabank. Uh, Scotiabank's 55% uh, of their revenue was net interest income. So RBC has a little bit more of that non-interest income revenue. I thought that was interesting to point out. Uh, EPS growth of 5% here, $8.75. Eight so EPS growth of 5% in 2019. So growth is definitely slowing, but still positive annually. Return on equity close to 17%. You can see 16.8 here. And provisions for capital losses. Uh, where is that number here? This 1.864 uh, 
billion, that represents about uh, 27 basis points of average net loans. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, it, actually, we're going to talk about it now. Uh, so the, the 27 basis points, <clears throat> again, if you compare to Scotia, which uh, we reviewed earlier in the year, Scotia had 48 basis points um, of provisioning. And so you, at, at first glance, you'd, you'd think that RBC might be under provisioning. Uh, Scotia does break theirs out between Canada and internationally, and they've got uh, significantly higher provisioning, uh, over 100 basis points for their international book. So if you look at it on a Canada only, it is in, it is in line with uh, what Scotia was provisioning as well. So 27 basis points, um, or about 1.86 billion for, for RBC. Okay, so there's the financial overview. <clears throat> and now let's talk about their Q4 results. You can just click in here. So in early December, RBC released uh, their Q4 results. And the big takeaway is that earnings per share were down year over year. So while earnings growth had slowed at some of the big Canadian banks, it hadn't turned negative, And this quarter it did. Uh, so earning, earnings of $2.18 a share down 1% year over year. Now, Canadian banking and wealth management performed well. You can see here personal and commercial wealth management up 5%, 32% respectively. Um, but the big drivers of the decline in earnings were, number one, an increase in provisions up to uh, 32 basis points. Uh, and that's a 41% negative change year over year. So you can see here the provisions for credit losses. Uh, so that's number one. And then number two, their investor and treasury services earnings were down 71% uh, here. I'll just point that out here. So net income for that particular segment was down materially. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the video. And I think the last point that I'll, I'll note here is the bank has been investing in growth. So non-interest expenses up 7% year over year got higher staff related costs, particularly in their wealth management mortgage businesses where they're trying to grow assets. They've also got severance costs in, in their investor and transaction services segment. Again, we'll talk about that a bit more. Uh, and they're investing in technology to support long-term business growth. So that digital transformation. So those are a few reasons why their expenses. And again, you can see it up here, unfavorable at 7%, 7% growth year over year. So <clears throat> on the investor call, I thought one quote that was interesting from the CEO was around uh, looking out to 2020 and not providing specific guidance, but talking about what they see and uh, how that might affect their targets. So I won't read all of this, uh, but he talks about continuing to see strength in their core markets, but based on what they're seeing today, the next couple of years are likely to be challenging given interest rate trends, uncertainty around global growth, trade tensions, and normalized credit conditions, amongst other factors. So he's calling out that he expects the next few years to be challenging. And then goes on to say, while meeting our 7% plus diluted EPS growth objective may be challenging in the near term, we are focused on meeting this target in, in the medium term, as we've done in recent years. So... Uh, and before that, he talked about being comfortable about hitting their return on equity, capital strength, and dividend payout ratio targets. But he's basically saying in the next year or two, the bank's unlikely to hit a 7% EPS growth rate. So I thought that was really interesting and pertinent to any investors looking at jumping into the stock right now. So next, we'll just talk about a few other key points before we jump into our key uh, considerations for the stock. So for 2019 overall, if you look at the segments, and we've talked about this a little bit, personal and commercial banking continues to perform well, up uh, net income up 6% year over year, wealth management up 13% year over year, insurance business performing nicely, albeit a, a smaller business uh, of the bank. Investor and treasury services is where we've had a big decrease, even though it's a small segment, that's a, a pretty large decline. And then capital markets, which can be a lumpy business from year to year, it also was a little bit softer, down 4%. Okay, so let's talk about the investor and treasury services segment. 
it's a, a specialist provider of asset services, leader in Canadian cash management uh, and transaction banking services, and a provider of treasury services to institutional clients. So they deal with institutions. They can provide custodial services, cash management, and and other um, and other services. You know, they've got a real strength in Canada, but they're competing globally. And if you look at net income for the last four years, obviously uh, 2019 was not a, a good year. You can see that in their efficiency ratio. So the cost of basically their staff relative um, to the revenue. And so what the bank's done in Q4 is <clears throat> realized a uh, $83 million after-tax severance and related costs. So they're they're reducing the size of this business segment. So net income of 45 million, which is down 71% year over year, down 17% if you exclude that one time impact of the, of the severance. And really the business trends that they're highlighting is lower funding and liquidity revenue, which is driven by the short-term rate environment, but there's also lower asset services revenue due to reduced client activity. So this is a segment where the fundamental trends are, are moving in the wrong direction. Banks taking steps to right size the business. And fortunately for investors, this is one of their smaller segments. If not, it is the smallest segment, segment. but interesting to see uh, whether they're able to turn this around uh, going forward. Digital, um, all of the banks and threat of fintech are increasingly spending more money and building out uh, digital assets to support the transformation of legacy in-person branch transactions to more uh, digital transactions, whether it's on your phone or otherwise. So I just wanted to highlight a few of the KPIs. You can see their active digital users are up 8% a year over the last few years. So they've got uh, over 7 million active digital users. Digital adoption rate is over 50%. Active mobile users, actually up 16% a year, close to 4.5 million. Mobile se sessions going up 20% a year. Self-serve transactions going up. And you can see here the branches basically flat. Now they've been shutting down some branches. It goes down slightly here. So again, just some interesting KPIs on what they're doing on the digital side. Residential, I think no no presentation or uh, analysis of a Canadian bank would be complete without at least talking about the Canadian housing market. And RBC had a couple of interesting slides in their investor presentations around this. And so the first one really just compares the Canadian landscape to that of the US. And the two charts that I wanted to highlight were equity ownership. So basically how much equity do Canadian homeowners have on average? Uh, and you can see it here somewhere between 70 and 75% uh, of equity. And you can see uh, in the US, and they track this back, and these numbers are going to be hard for you to see, but this was obviously the crisis of 08, 09, 10. Um, and you can see that in Canada, the equity ownership was always stronger historically and continues to be stronger even with the US recovery well underway. So there, RBC is just pointing out some of the fundamental differences in the housing markets between Canada and the U.S., and I think it is important to take note. The other one I'll point out here is mortgage delinquencies. So you can see the U.S. in the orange line really spiked up here. But I think the important part of this chart is if you look at mortgage delinquencies, even now are significantly higher than Canadian delinquencies. So if you look at this, and this chart goes back, uh, well, 30 years. So mortgage delinquencies are at a 30-year low in Canada, and there's no question that a rise in delinquencies would hit bank earnings. But if you look at if you look at going back historically, Canada has always been a very different um, mortgage market than in the U.S. <clears throat> and then the other thing that I'll mention on the residential side or the housing side is they just point out their specific portfolio. Um, and I thought what was interesting here, the uninsured portfolio is 65% of uh, RBC's mortgage portfolio, which I actually thought was pretty high. So on the insured side, insured by uh, CMHC, uh, Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation, 35%. But on the uninsured side, 65 uh, That being said, when you dive a little bit deeper, you can look at the loan to values here across the different provinces. They're in between... 
48, roughly in between 50 to 60%. So there's a fair amount of cushion. Housing prices would be able to fall 10, maybe even 20% without really um, getting too close to the bank security levels. Now, of course, these are averages, so you're going to have some uh, some units in here that, that might be affected. But by and large, they've got a lot of protection. And then the other thing I thought that was really interesting here, they talk about Vancouver and Toronto housing markets. And you can see their loan to value in those two markets are below 50%. So they're taking a more conservative view uh, in those two sort of hotter housing markets and making sure that they're, they're well protected. So I thought that was important to point out. All right. Uh, so that brings us to key considerations for the stock. And if you uh, go back and take a look at our Scotiabank video, these are largely going to be the same. There's a few tweaks, uh, which makes sense. Um, oligopoly of Canadian banking is going to be largely similar to the trends. So let's talk about it. Strengths, uh, one of the Canada's big five banks uh, operating in a regulated environment. In fact, they're the biggest uh, by market cap. They've got a great track record of, of profitability and book value per share growth. Again, if you go to that 10-year page at the back of the annual report, you really start to appreciate how well um, the Canadian banks and RBC have, have done it at uh, growing asset base earnings, book value over time. Non-interest revenue, over 55% of, of total. I actually think that's a real strength, especially when we talk about the challenging macro environment, compressing net interest margins, spreads, maybe a a slowing housing market in Canada, having a business that drives over half of its revenue from non-interest revenue, I think is a real strength for RBC. Risks, uh, fintech disruption threat, saying we talked about this in the Scotiabank video, hard to really posit exactly what that's going to mean or look like, but there's no question that RBC is investing heavily on the digital side to hopefully either keep pace or stay ahead of any of these trends. But, you know, in a worst case, it could lead to deposit erosion. Haven't seen it yet. Or customer erosion. Risks, again, credit losses, overheated Canadian housing market, commercial corporate loans. When we talk about provisioning in, in the 27 to 32 basis point level, that's low. That's, that's definitely low. Um, and for now, it seems to be working. But any uptick in that... Uh, you could reasonably see a scenario where uh, provisioning doubles or more. Uh, so right now provisioning is at, at uh, long-term lows. And then slower growth in the medium term, I think. And, and RBC has talked about that on their most recent conference call. I think they're basically coming out and saying it. Uh, this is going to be a lower growth stock for the next year or two. So key drivers, asset and deposit growth, credit quality and provisioning, and then interest rates, and specifically the net net interest margins, uh, which is the spread between what the bank's able to receive on the loans that it uh, puts out and the deposits that it takes in, the interest that it has to pay out on those. Okay, so if we move into our bull base and bear case scenario, let's start with the, the bull side. And the bull side is probably made, maybe a little bit conservative, but we're, we're sort of taking what the CEO is telling us. And we're saying the bull case is actually if they continue to grow earnings at 7%. So even though uh, RBC has come out and said that that could be difficult, you know, expect earnings growth lower than that in the near term, let's say they actually hit it. So they get that EPS growth of 7%, steady growth, no credit deterioration, improved efficiency ratio, uh, the investor transaction services and capital markets businesses rebound slightly. So I'm not calling for a huge rebound here, but everything starts moving back in the right direction. And that helps them meet that 7% earnings per share growth. That would drive $9.35 EPS in 2020, fiscal 2020. And we put a 14 times multiple. So recall it trades at about 12 times right now. It has traded up towards this level historically. Um, we'll see, it might be being a little ambitious here, but 14 times $9.35 gets you to implied share price of $130 roughly, and that's up 27% from current levels, plus you're getting a 4% dividend. Base case, we're essentially saying EPS is gonna grow at 3%. It's gonna grow roughly where they've guided 
us two on the call, which is going to be tough to hit that 7%. Uh, probably going to be positive, but low single digits. Some macro headwinds, which again, RBC is calling for. Uh, net interest margin compressure, uh, but no major deterioration in credit. This would get you to $9 of earnings per share next year. Put an 11 times multiple on that, and that gets you an implied share price of $99. And that's down 4%. But of course, you're getting a 4% dividend, so you'd be about even if the base case played out next year. And lastly, the bear case, uh, reduction in earnings driven by increased credit provisions as well as slowdown in Canadian housing. So again, similar to what we did with Scotia, really just doubled the credit provisioning here and, and held the rest of the business flat. And that would get you to $7.50 earnings per share. Uh, put a nine multiple on that, and that gets you to an implied share price of $67.50, which would be down 35%. So those are the three scenarios for Royal Bank. Let me know what you think. Will RBC's share price continue to weaken amid lower earnings growth, or is now an attractive entry point for this solid blue chip bank? That's a wrap on our video for RBC. That's a wrap on 2019. That's a wrap on a great year in the markets. We'll be back soon with more content. But until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sound.